Hello, this is Joe Yuhan here to talk about the ankle joint. Why the mobility of the bones of the ankle is so important, how we lose it, its implications for both pain and problems, and why we need it for efficient running. So the ankle is technically three bones. We're talking about the two leg bones, which is the tibia, which is this big bone coming down. That is our main weight-bearing bone. The fibula bone is on the outside. That's less weight-bearing and more of a control bone. They articulate with this go-between right here between my fingers called the talus. So the talus sits between tib and fib and then the rest of the foot and ankle, namely the calcaneus and back and the midfoot and front. These bones, need to be both stable, but also mobile. They need to move for our athletic function. So let's talk about the big movements first, then we're gonna talk about the little joint movements that are really important. So the big movements with running are dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, inversion, eversion. So dorsiflexion is really important. So we're running, we land on the ground. As our body passes over that leg, the Ankle has to dorsiflex through its full range, then it comes up, then we plantar flex and we push off behind. We swing through into dorsiflexion, land again, dorsiflex more, plantar flex push off. That's the main running movement, but there's some important movements in this plane too. Inversion, when we initially land, as a cushioning action, so we initially land, we get to mid stance, we get on this first ray, ball of the foot and big toe, and we push off. That's a really important cushioning control movement that's um, really important to have in the ankle. But to do the big movements, these bones have to do little movements. And so the little movements are called arthrokinematics, so it's just the movement of the joint itself. And those are slides and glides and little rotations and things. And so if we're talking about the three bones of the ankle, tib, fib, and talus, and if we're talking about really what's the most important or easiest lost mobility in the ankle, it tends to be a loss of dorsiflexion. And so what needs to happen at this joint for dorsiflexion? There's a couple different things. The talus itself does a little posterior glide. So it just shifts back the whole bone itself on the calcaneus and beneath the tib and fib. And the reason that's important is if we want to dorsiflex, there has to be a folding of these bones. If the talus kind of sits in front and these try to fold, it kind of just pinches. I can kind of illustrate this easier with my hands. So this is the top of, or the dome of the talus. This is the tib and fib. If this stays here and I'm trying to get over the top, it can get pinchy in the front unless that translates back a little bit. So now that tib and fib can come over. So that's a really important movement of the talus. Talus has to go back, but the tib and fib also have to go back. And so even though they come over the top, on one hand, if you look in the front, can you see how there's these, I'm gonna go this way so you guys can kind of see the space. There is a side handle component to the tib and fib. And so for that movement to happen, they actually have to slide and glide posterior also. So going in dorsiflexion, fibula has to glide that way, tibia has to glide that way. We get a posterior glide to basically efficiently roll over. Not super important to understand that other than to know that is a subtle movement that is really easily lost. So those are the movements. So how do we lose this? Well, the biggest way that we lose this acutely is in an ankle sprain. And the most common ankle sprain is when we inversion sprain it. And that is going too far into that opening. And so when we go too far, the ligaments here overstretch. They can overstretch, they can all out tear. What typically happens, we tend to think, okay, well, 
I'm gonna rest it. The doctor says, let's put a boot on, let's put a cast on, we wait four to six weeks, it heals great, we're ready to go. The problem is, even though these tissues may be healed, we may not have automatically restored mobility of these joints, of these bones. And so what can happen is, is when we go into an inversion, sometimes these bones move a little bit. The talus can move, the fibula can move, and the tibia doesn't quite move, but it can get stuck. And when we lose either efficient alignment or efficient movement, now all of a sudden, our big movements aren't as good anymore, and that's when we get problems. So let's talk about, like, what are the main things that can happen in an ankle sprain? And so if we invert too hard, this talus bone, which sits right here, the talus can get a little bit rotated, it can get a little bit tilted, and it'll just stay there. And so now, if this talus is sort of like tilted that way, it just doesn't roll over the top of it quite as good as it used to. Or what's also common is it can rotate. It gets a little twist to it. So it may go, I'm exaggerating this a little bit, it can twist in or out. So same thing, if the talus bone, if we wanted to point this direction, here's the tib and fib over the top of it, if it's twisted, it doesn't move this direction very well anymore. That's a big problem. And so that you're gonna lose the big movement. Here's another thing that can happen. The fibula, sometimes because this fibula doesn't bear a lot of weight, if the ankle sprain is hard enough, what can happen to the fibula is it can actually slide down. If this is where the fibula is in space, it can actually shift down. So now it's stuck lower. And runners can check this in the mirror, or at least you can have somebody like, a, like myself or another PT look at this and see, okay, this is now a half centimeter lower. The consequence to that, not only you can imagine now this doesn't move as well in this plane, but it's going to shove and keep this ankle in an inverted state. So the people who think, oh, I've sprained an ankle and now like, I just am constantly rolling it, there's this idea that, oh, it's because these ligaments are now overstretched. That's not necessarily the case. It may be that this fibula is lower. So now these ligaments that might be a centimeter long are only, that space is only a half centimeter. So now they're on slack. So they're loose, they're unstable, not because the cord itself is too long, but because the bones that are attached to that space has shrunk from here to here. So that's a big thing that I treat a lot clinically, and that can happen with an inversion sprain, either a big one or even just repetitive over rolling. That's what the fibula can do. Lastly, the tibia tends to just get jammed up. And so again, the tibia needs to just fold efficiently forward. But if it gets stuck, especially if it gets stuck over off to the side, what the tibia will do instead is instead of going straight forward, it will rotate. It'll kind of, it won't get that glide back anymore. Instead of doing that, it just gets stuck and it'll just do, it'll twist instead. That has huge implications upstream. Knee pain, as I wrote about in my complex knee article, a lot of knee pain comes from torsion or twisting of the femur and tibia. A huge component of that twisting happens at a stiff ankle when the tibia can't move on the inside. Huge problem, huge implications for knee pain. So these bones, we really need to keep track of how they move because they can cause so many problems besides repetitive ankle sprains, besides pain around here. They can cause knee pain. They can cause chronic foot pain, because again, if I'm shifted down over here, it's gonna make me just kind of bear weight on the outside of my foot. That could cause pain over here, or it could cause pain from hyperpronation that can happen on the inside of the foot. Lastly, a stiff ankle can cause hip pain and back pain, because if an ankle can't dorsiflex, and I'm trying to get a nice, long hip extension, to get good hip extension, my ankle has to dorsiflex as far 
as my hip extends. If my ankle stops, my hip has to stop. And so I'm either going to get hip pain because this isn't moving, or I'm going to try to extend from my low back. Now we have a generator for both hip and low back pain if this thing isn't moving. So we know, okay, this, this, this has to move. Well, fine, why don't we just stretch it? Here's the problem with most conventional ankle stretching is the idea of layers. And so when we do a calf stretch or an ankle stretch where we're just kind of leaning and pushing up against a wall, what is that stretch? More often than not, it's stretching the soft tissue behind the foot, ankle, and lower leg. So I go into this stretch, I'm stretching where my hands are, that represents the fascia muscles tendons. Great, they may be really tight and they need that. But just because I'm stretching the soft tissue doesn't mean I'm restoring both the alignment and the mobility of these individual bones. So we can stretch and stretch and stretch, but it doesn't change that arthrokinematic movement or the alignment of the bone. Big problem. And so that's where the belt ankle stretch comes in. Clinically, if you come and see a manual PT like myself or another um, hands-on worker, we can do direct energy strategies to realign these bones and get them moving. But if you don't have that, or if you do have that, but you need to reinforce that movement, the belt ankle stretch is a wonderful strategy to give high energy targeted force to these bones. And so in part two, in the other video, I'm gonna show you that, but basically the belt goes right here and it's gonna apply that posterior force that the talus needs and the tib fib need to restore ankle joint dorsiflexion, not just calf mobility. And that's the big difference. So stay tuned for part two of that video where I show you that, but this is a, my explanation of how important bone mobility, joint mobility is for the ankle complex.